Okay. Uh, thanks, Graham. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, session of Quantum History Seminar. Uh, my name is uh, Debbie Ma. I'm currently based in Hitotsubashi University and also LSE in London. Uh, uh, thanks again to Hong Kong University, Zhu Wu and Chi Chen for organizing this and for, um, well, inviting, it's not so much cheering, but inviting me to host uh, the presentation that we given by uh, Professor Steve Robbery. Now, I will keep my introduction very short so as to make sure that I give maximum time to, uh, to Steve. Uh, I, uh, Steve is, uh, well, in many ways, a, a friend, a mentor, and, and, and former colleague. And uh, he's been a world's leading authority and expert on uh, global productivity comparison, and in particular, constructing of the historical national accounts. Uh, I should start out by emphasizing Steve you know, has been really working uh, firstly on Europe and then also around the world for, for the last 10 years, you know, teaming up with uh, uh, Han Hui and, and David Lee at, uh, in Beijing, uh, working on Chinese national accounts, uh, especially in related to the Great Divergence debate. Uh, their paper has been published recently in the Journal of Economic History, and they are, uh, you know, as you see, they'll be moving further into that research. But, um, so it's really wonderful in many ways. I was sometimes joking that um, Steve is now is our China specialist at Oxford now. He has really digged very deep into the historical national accounts of reconstructing um, a long-term statistics for China. Um, so I think Steve will probably present for about one hour and, and you can send in questions um, and we won't be answering, I think Steve won't be answering those questions when he was presenting, but after that, uh, we will go through the questions and, um, and answer as much as possible. Okay. Uh, without further ado, um, let me hand it over, we used the microphone to Steve, but, there, but let me hand it over to, to Steve now. I hope everybody can hear us okay, right, on the tech side. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction, Devin. Um, um, I'm going to try and share the screen now. Um, okay, everyone can see that. Um, in that case, I will make a start. The uh, title is uh, Accounting for the Great Divergence, Recent Findings from Historical National Accounting. And um, I'm not able to move it. That's not working. Let me start again. Yeah. That looks better. Yeah. Okay, that's working now. Okay. Um, so um, I should say that uh, I first produced. Um, a paper with the title Accounting for the Great Divergence, which came out as an LSE discussion paper in 2013. Um, and that was after I'd given a lecture in Madrid. Um, what I've done today is to um, update this enormously, because since 2013, there's been a huge amount of additional work in the national historical national accounting framework. Um, I think it's fair to say that much of the original paper was about um, setting out what happened during the Great Divergence, the um, historical national accounts for European and um, some provisional estimates for Asian economies. Um, 
What I want to do today is to focus more on the explanation rather than the just the presentation of the data. So uh, what I would say here is that there are two ways of interpreting the word accounting. One is in that traditional way of uh, measurement um, and how we account for the divergent performance uh, using historical national accounting. Um, I'm going to briefly summarize that material in the first 15 minutes or so, and then work on the second interpretation of accounting. If I provide an account of my behavior, then I explain it. Uh, we need to explain why the divergence happened. And I want to talk about work which has um, begun to um, be more precise about that, uh, which is, this work has taken place over the last uh, five, 10 years. So I'm gonna begin with um, a section on measuring economic growth before 1870. And the approach I'm gonna take here is to emphasize the um, differences that have emerged from the work of Angus Madison. Angus Madison produced um, the first estimates of GDP per capita um, covering the second millennium. And uh, I want to see how the more recent estimates differ from that. Uh, so um, this first figure here sets out on the left-hand side, the estimates of Angus Madison, uh, and over on the right-hand side, the uh, new estimates uh, by uh, various authors. Um, so if we start with uh, Angus Madison's estimates, you will see that um, most economies start off uh, around about the year 1000 with GDP per capita of around about 400 1990 international dollars. This is very close to bare bones subsistence. Remember in 1990, the World Bank's poverty line was a dollar a day. Um, so if everybody was at bare bones subsistence, that would be $365 would be the per capita GDP. Um, so 400 is pretty close to that. And it's explained by most people living at bare bones subsistence with a small elite um, that pulls up the average a little bit. Um, and uh, then that's sort of linked up to the more recent estimates working back from the present um, to produce a picture of you know fairly stable growth um, going across the whole uh, millennium everywhere is growing um, now over on the right hand side we have the new estimates so uh, there's um, my own work with Bruce Campbell, Alex Klein, Mark Overton, and Bos von Leeuwen on Britain. You have Van Zanden and von Leeuwen on the Netherlands, Paolo Malanima on Italy, and Alvaro Nagal and Prada Stelescazura on uh, Spain. Um, I've picked those uh, economies to highlight a general finding, which is um, this idea of a little divergence that um, originally at the beginning of the millennium, um, Italy and Spain were the rich economies uh, and Britain and the Netherlands were relatively poor. And by uh, the 19th century, um, it's the other way around. There's been a reversal of fortunes. That's what we call the little divergence. I think it comes out rather more clearly in the new estimates because in the new estimates, um, Britain and the Netherlands start out clearly below Italy and Spain. The other thing though, which really stands out is that the new estimates suggest that growth was rather slower and that most uh, West European economies are well above bare bones subsistence um, already uh, in the early part of the second millennium. 
And in particular, you'll see that if we take the Mediterranean economies of Italy and Spain, although you have some periods of growth, this is followed by periods of negative growth or shrinking, so that over the long run, there's no, no trend. And that's true for um, Spain as well through to the 19th century. So growth is really limited to Northwest Europe, uh, exemplified here by Britain and the Netherlands. So two, two main differences then. One is that um, most European economies are richer in the medieval period than Madison thought. They're not at bare bones subsistence um, in the early part of the millennium. And secondly, we have this picture of that this little divergence is occurring because of stagnation in Mediterranean Europe and growth only in Northwest Europe. Um, now this figure here adds in some more countries and in particular since that lecture I gave in Spain in 2012-2013 we have a lot more economies um, due to work by um, Reich and Palmer on Portugal, Ridolfi on France, Schoen and Krantz on Sweden, Malinowski on Poland, um, sorry, Malinowski and Van Zanden, and um, Baust on uh, Belgium, Pfister on Germany. And what these uh, additional estimates show is that picture of long-run stagnation in most European countries um, you know, generalizes outside the four economies I, I showed you um, a moment ago. So it's, it's growing and shrinking, growing and shrinking, growing and shrinking, but no long run progress. So really it's there's this sort of exceptional path in Northwest Europe of uh, gradually building up before we get to the Industrial Revolution. So that's the picture of the little divergence in Europe to which we need to add a little divergence in Asia. Again, I want to highlight the differences between the old Madison estimates and the newer uh, estimates. Uh, I've included here um, studies for um, China, Japan, and India, all of which uh, I've been involved in producing the data. Um, again, there's the revisions suggest that Madison underestimated the level of incomes in, um, in Asia as well as in Europe when we get back to the year 1000. It's, it, it, so again, it's all, every, all countries are around about 400 to 500 1990 international dollars in the year 1000 uh, in Madison's estimates. And really Madison is finding uh, nothing much happening in Asia in all of this period through to 1870. Everywhere is poor and remains poor. We've included the British data just so you can see by comparison what's happening in Northwest Europe. The new estimates though I think suggest quite a different picture. And something which I think fits rather more, uh, rather better with um, most people's understandings of history of China being not uh, very poor in the year 1000, but rather in the Northern Song Dynasty having GDP per capita around about a thousand 1990 international dollars. That's two and a half times bare bones subsistence. Um, and uh, it stays you know, quite high during the Ming Dynasty and really goes into decline only in the Qing dynasty. Um, India also is on a path of decline from the height of the Mughal Empire, around about 1600 there, it's trending down. The difference in the uh, Japanese case from Madison's estimates are, well, you know, they look quite poor, um, through to the Tokugawa shogunate, really. Um, 
And what's happened here is that the estimates for the uh, late 19th century have been pulled up as a result of revisions in the 20th century and late 19th century um, by Kyoji Fukao and uh, his co-authors. Um, I think the biggest change there was, was due to the treatment of hyperinflation during World War II, so that Japan uh, at the time of the Meiji Restoration was already um, no longer a, a really poor economy. So we get this little divergence coming out rather more clearly in the new estimates then as China goes into decline and Japan is um, rising towards modern economic growth. And I think this revised pattern for Japan is quite important because we have to bear in mind that Japan was the first Asian economy to achieve modern economic growth. If we put the two sides together, Europe and Asia, we get um, the picture in uh, figure five here. Um, China starts out probably the richest economy in the world in the year 1000, the Northern Song Dynasty. Um, but by 1300, you can already see uh, some of the small European economies. Um, Italy uh, is already ahead. Um, and by 1600, also the Netherlands. We're seeing the Dutch Golden Age here. So uh, it's tempting to think that the Great Divergence had already begun by 1300 or 1600. But I think we need to be careful here because we have to bear in mind the difference in the size of economies like China and India and any small nation state within Europe. You know, in 1600, the population of China is about 160 million. Um, in England, it's about four and a half million, something like that. Um, so it's likely that um, with an economy the size of China, that there's going to be some region um, which will be much richer than the average for China as a whole. And when we compare the leading region of China with the leading region of Europe, then it seems that you know, the divergence doesn't really occur until um, after 1700. That's earlier than Pomerantz suggested. Remember, Pomerantz was claiming it wouldn't be until after 1800. But I think you have to bear in mind that China is on this downward trajectory in per capita terms in the 18th century. Um, and the leading European region um, you know, is Northwest Europe is forging ahead here. So the European leader here is derived from the level in Italy through to 1540, then the Netherlands from 1540 to 1800, and then finally Britain from 1800. When we've um, reconstructed the China leader here is somewhat more speculative um, in the sense that we do have estimates for the Yangtze Delta in the 1820s, um, which we can compare with the Netherlands. Um, you know, this kind of scale difference is there. And what we've then done is to look at the relationship between the Yangtze Delta and China as a whole and notice that the Yangtze Delta is about 75% richer than China as a whole in, um, in the 1820s. And then we project back that ratio. And that is, I think, a fairly conservative estimate. Um, there are certainly cases in Europe's history where that peak uh, the difference between the European leader and the European average would be substantially higher than that. So I think this um, is um, indicative of the broad situation, but further research is clearly needed on uh, Chinese regional GDP per capita 
to really confirm that. So the great divergence, uh, in my view, uh, really begins uh, around about the beginning of the 18th century, not the beginning of the 19th century. Um, actually, Ken Pomerantz has said, this is not so different from his view, he thinks maybe he would say 1750. Um, now, he doesn't think uh, that um, it's as late as the 19th century. Uh, and obviously, this is very different from the older Eurocentric views, which tended to think the Great Divergence began in the late Middle Ages or the very early, early modern period. So that's um, the picture on the first part of the paper then, really, which is about when did the Great Divergence begin. What I now want to do, though, is to turn to explanations. And here I'm going to draw on a distinction made by Angus Madison between the proximate and ultimate sources of growth. And I'm going to begin with the proximate sources. And here we use conventional growth accounting. Um, now, it's important, I think, to distinguish between growth accounting in extensive form, which seeks to explain uh, the, the, the growth of output in terms of the growth of capital, labor, human capital, and land, and then the residual item uh, TFP growth. So that's, that's, you're trying to explain growth by the factor inputs and the productivity with which those inputs are used. But I think for the great divergence, we're really more interested in the growth accounting in intensive form because we're seeking to explain the change and the emergence of a gap in GDP per capita, uh, which is a sort of crude form of labor productivity. So um, we can use the, reorganize the growth accounting equation in um, labor productivity terms. So labor productivity is, can be related to growing capital intensity, growing human capital intensity, growing land intensity, and then the residual item of total factor productivity growth. Uh, let's now think about the, uh, the data that we have on these various um, uh, proximate causes. Um, and I want to begin with labor input. Now, we want clearly to think of this not just in terms of the number of workers, but also the intensity with which people work. So there's this idea of an industrious revolution, um, but also the changing quality of the labor force, the growth of human capital. Uh, now, the idea of the Industrious Revolution is that people increased their supply of effort because they wanted to be able to afford the new goods that were being made available as a result of uh, firstly long distance trade. In Europe, goods were coming in from the Far East, um, silks, spices, uh, and so on. Um, but also from the New World, you have tobacco, sweet corn and so on. And then domestically, you have industrial innovation, which is producing uh, new goods. There have been long attempts to try to quantify this. Um, I think in particular, Joachim Foltz's uh, brilliant study from about 20 years ago, where he was looking at court records um, and seeing what people were doing at various times of the day and various days of the week. Um, so you, he, he was able to identify an intensification of work uh, through that. But I think we now have a, a, a continuous series of the number of days worked per year from um, this uh, great paper by Humphreys and Meistorf, which came out in the Economic Journal last year. Uh, I can show you this for, for England then. Um, days worked per year, which is clearly trending up from 
um, around about 1500. Um, it fluctuates a bit, uh, but this is obtained by comparing the uh, annual contracts, uh, how much you were paid on an annual contract versus how much you were paid if you were hired on a daily basis. So the idea there is obviously arbitrage because people could choose to have an annual contract or to work and be paid daily, um, that there'll be uh, a close relationship between the um, daily wage multiplied by the number of days worked and the annual contract. And this is what um, comes out from that with a sort of increase from about 150 days a year to uh, over 300. Um, Jan de Vries finds a similar pattern in the Netherlands um, and contrasts that with what's happening in Southern Europe. The Catholic parts of Europe um, have a much slower elimination of saints days um, uh, and therefore um, they, uh, they are working less days per year. I mentioned uh, Jan de Vries there, and um, in Europe, at least, um, the idea of an industrious revolution is associated with Jan de Vries. However, it, I think it's, we should say that um, the idea was originated by Hayami writing on Tokugawa Japan. And I think that's interesting because we're trying to explain the transition to modern economic growth in Northwest Europe, yes, but we also want to have in mind in the Great Divergence debate that Japan is the first economy in Asia to achieve modern economic growth. And it's, we need to look out for signs of similar developments um, uh, occurring <coughs> in Japan. Of course, uh, Working harder may be useful in getting growth going, um, but it's not going to be very helpful in sustaining growth. Um, you need more than that. Uh, obviously, there's a limit to the number of days a year you can work, the number of hours a day you can work. So you can't go on increasing those forever. In the long run, then, to achieve sustained growth, it's the quality of the labor force that will be uh, more important and we have to think about human capital accumulation and here um, I'll show you some data on this in a moment but um, Northwest Europe had a different demographic regime from the rest of the world um, it has a number of key features but the one we're interested in here is the later marriage of females later first marriage of females and hence their limited fertility. That helps to encourage human capital accumulation because if you, a family has fewer children, then they can invest more in each child. Um, it also means um, women don't go sort of straight into, the, into um, from childhood into um, marriage and producing children but they have more labor market opportunities. So that's, that's further boost to human capital accumulation. Uh, now we have, um, again, good data on the development of human capital over the long run in Britain. Um, it's a study by Sandra de Plight, um, which is in Cleometrica, which shows you uh, changing literacy. It's really arising from, you know, one or two percent in 1300 to uh, almost everybody being literate by the uh, end of the 19th century. So a dramatic change in um, the quality of the labour force. To get in a sort of more European perspective, um, uh, a wider European perspective, um, we can look at book production. Um, this is from uh, Boring and Van Zanden. Uh, book production per thousand inhabitants. Um, uh, I should say the 14th century um, is uh, manuscript books. This is monks 
in monasteries copying out texts. Uh, and then from 1454, we have the printing press arrives in Europe. And um, this is the number of new titles in each country um, per thousand inhabitants. Uh, you can see that Italy is the um, biggest book producer in the manuscript era. Um, and as we go into the early modern period, Britain and the Netherlands in Northwest Europe becoming uh, more dominant. Uh, as I say, this is underpinned by the age of first marriage amongst females. Um, uh, in England and the Netherlands, it's about 25 or 26. Um, 23, 24 in uh, Mediterranean Europe and in the Asian economies, large Asian economies, China and India, uh, very much lower, 18.6 in China, 13 in India. And again, interestingly, Japan is an intermediate case, rather closer to the European marriage pattern at 22.1. So that's um, looking at the labour side. The other major inputs are physical capital and land. Again, we have um, the best capital stock data for Northwest Europe. Um, uh, I've been studying the capital stock and investment in Britain together with Sandra de Plight. Um, and we, we are going back to about 1270. Um, and then uh, Van Zanden and von Leeuwen have capital stock data for Holland from 1540. Um, table seven here shows you the British capital stock. Um, and uh, domestic reproducible capital is the sum of fixed capital and working capital. If we leave the dwellings in the fixed capital, you'll see that fixed capital and working capital are broadly similar magnitude through to about 1500. And then, although working capital continues to increase, it increases dramatically faster in fixed capital, including dwellings. And then if we remove the dwellings, you'll see fixed capital excluding dwellings, which is the kind of capital we can think of as entering the aggregate production function and producing more output, um, that grows even more rapidly. We have also long run data on the arable acreage in England that comes from um, the study I was involved in on British economic growth. Um, we have to include land in the growth accounting exercise over this long period because, of course, agriculture was the most important sector uh, in the Middle Ages. Um, now, in fact, the land area um, declines after the Black Death. Remember, the Black Death hits in the mid 14th century, wipes out a third of the population overnight, and the population keeps falling through to the mid 15th century. So the land, cultivated land area also declines and then uh, grows uh, from the mid 15th century. Okay, so let's now have a look at the British growth accounting results. Uh, I'm going to start by looking at these in extensive form. Um, so we're trying to explain the growth of output. We have uh, the labour input, which is measured by the population multiplied by the day's work per person. Uh, then we have human capital is the literacy rate times population. Um, capital is the fixed capital, <coughs> excluding dwellings, and land is the cultivated acreage. The weight, weighting scheme is 40% for labour, 20% for human capital, 30% for capital and land is 10%. Here's the um, 
summary growth accounting uh, of the growth accounting data. Uh, output growth on the left here, that's what we're trying to explain. And essentially it can be broken down into the weighted input growth and TFP growth. Um, so those together sum to the output growth. Uh, and I think you can see pretty clearly that um, output growth is being driven predominantly by the growth of the weighted inputs. Um, they move much more closely together than TFP growth. Um, and the input growth is really driven largely by population growth. So there's this huge population collapse after the Black Death in the 1340s and the 1400s, and that's really driving the weighted input growth, which in turn drives the output growth. Uh, there's one exception to that, and that is the 1400s to 1450s, when you'll see TFP growth actually is the key driver. So TFP growth in that period falls by um, minus 0.35% minus a year. That's driving the output growth of minus 0.21% a year. But in all other years, the TFP growth doesn't move very closely to the output growth at all. And TFP growth um, is only important in that period, 1400s to 1450s. It's basically a story of weighted input growth. And um, in the early stages, driven by population, and in the later stages, capital is becoming more important. You'll see really sort of capital growth really increasing um, as we go uh, into the Industrial Revolution. So for uh, extensive growth, it's really driven by inputs. But we're really more interested in the intensive growth accounting. We want to know what's happening to GDP per capita. So we really need to know about what's, what are the drivers of labor productivity? Is it growing capital intensity, growing human capital intensity, growing land intensity, or is it innovation giving you um, uh, an increase in TFP growth. Uh, so um, let's have a look at that. Um, in this case, you can see very much in contrast to the extensive growth accounting, it's TFP growth, um, which is playing um, uh, a more important part than the weighted factor deepening. Um, so Labour productivity growth is being driven by TFP growth, not by weighted factor deepening in most periods. And generally the difference is very large. It's that there's a long period here where weighted factor deepening is essentially close to zero. In other words, human capital, physical capital and land are only keeping up with the growth of the population. So there is no um, growing intensity of, um, of the factor deepening. And, that, and therefore, TFP growth becomes the key uh, factor. There's one exception to that, and that is um, 1340s to 1400s. You do see weighted factor deepening actually being more important for the labor productivity growth than the TFP growth. Uh, slightly more of the labour productive growth is explained by factor deepening than TFP growth in the 1340s or 1400s. And what's happening there is the population falls uh, and you then get an increase in capital per person. If you survived, you had more capital, you had more land as well. So the, this is this positive boost in the land labor ratio. Um, but in all other periods, it's really TFP growth that's dominant. Uh, but you can begin to see uh, capital deepening becoming more important um, from the 1830s, so that 
weighted factor deepening has some role there. But there's no doubt that the general picture is for uh, TFP growth to be the key determinant. For the Netherlands, we have data from um, 1540 from Van Zanden and von Leuven. Uh, they provided growth accounting only in extensive form, but we're really more interested in the intensive form for the great divergence debate. Again, you can see uh, it's TFP growth, which is the key driver of labor productivity growth. When TFP growth is strong, labor productivity growth is strong uh, and, and, and vice versa. Um, so uh, if we ask, you know, what does the growth accounting show us? It reminds me of um, a famous uh, quote from McCluskey writing on the British Industrial Revolution. He wrote uh, in 1981, ingenuity rather than abstention governed the Industrial Revolution. So if we think in terms of the intensive growth accounts that I've just shown you, the great divergence really is caused by this um, upward trend in Northwest Europe, and I've shown you the growth accounts for Northwest Europe, what's happening is that <coughs> labor productivity growth um, is being driven largely by TFP growth, that is the ingenuity, um, uh, and not by accumulating physical and human capital per person or, or, or any increase in the land labor ratio. There's one other um, proximate source of growth, which we um, ought to talk about a little bit, and that is um, structural change. The growth accounts have been done at the macro level, but um, we're seeing the uh, Northwest European economies move away from agriculture and producing specialized industrial and service sectors uh, rather early on. Um, so the share of agriculture in the European labor force, um, in, in lots of economies, it's, you know, it's about 60% in the uh, Middle Ages. And first in the Netherlands, uh, it drops down to 40%, also then in Britain and then on down to 30%. Uh, whereas in places like Italy and Spain, it's staying stable at about 60%. We can pick up the same sort of picture in the pattern of urbanization. Um, I should move on a bit here, but um, let me just show you the basic data here. Um, uh, the the um, you start off with two main um, centers of urbanization in uh, central and northern Italy in 1300 and in the low countries, Netherlands and Belgium early on. Um, what happens is that uh, in Italy you, you start to get stagnation and in fact a slight decline um, after 1500, Spain and Portugal, there's an early boost between 1500 and 1600 because they are involved in um, the discovery of the new world and the new trade routes to uh, Asia. Um, but then they go into decline as well. And, it, and it's, it's, it's Britain and the Netherlands again that have the, the latest surge in, in uh, urbanization. So um, that's what I wanted to say about um, the uh, proximate sources of growth. But if we really want to explain what's going on, we need to think about the underlying ultimate sources. Because even if it's due to better technology um, or more investment or hard work, um, we would want to know why was it that the, the Northwest European economies produced this better technology or invested more in capital or, um, or 
uh, improved the or worked harder. Now, I'm going to divide the ultimate sources into two main categories, uh, institutions and geography. So um, institutions, of course, there's been so much work on this in economic history um, since the work of Douglas North. Um, and the key issue here really um, is about um, the role of the state. Uh, now, there are two uh, strands in this literature, I think, which um, emphasize either the building up of state capacity or the um, building up of executive constraints. Um, so Epstein and O'Brien are perhaps the key writers in the state capacity side. They're, they're um, looking at the world um, through the idea that medieval states were too weak. Um, so the idea there was that although you had a, a what seemed like an all-powerful king, he relied on the support of the feudal lords um, and to get their support he had to allow them to exercise monopoly power in their own lands. Um, and that meant that you didn't have a unified market. So to, to provide a unified market um, and bring about market integration, you needed centralization of state power. And then you would uh, <coughs> obtain taxes and be able to provide public goods, which would stimulate economic growth. Um, that's a very different way of looking at the world from the early work of Ashimoglu, Johnson and Robinson, for example. Um, they think, um, you know, the medieval world was full of very strong rulers who were able to do what they wanted, interfere with merchants and kind of you know, destroy the, um, the uh, investments or innovations that these merchants you know, needed to produce to bring about modern economic growth. They emphasize the difference between Britain and the Netherlands, where the uh, parliament exercised constraint on the rulers, and Spain and Portugal, where absolute rulers could ride roughshod over those uh, constraints. I think recent work has tended to sort of integrate both views. Um, I like to think of um, Mark Dincheco's book on European nation states as demonstrating quite convincingly that um, success in bringing about economic growth uh, required both fiscal centralization and um, politically limited, limited states. Um, so um, just to sort of put some quantitative flesh on that, um, we can have a look at firstly per capita fiscal revenues. We'll see they rise uh, dramatically uh, in Northwest Europe, the Dutch Republic and England um, during the 17th and 18th centuries. They really forge ahead in terms of per capita fiscal revenues. Uh, the rest of Europe lags behind. We have some data on China here um, from Brandt, Mar and Rorsky, um, and some work on, on, on India, um, showing you uh, China and India also failing to keep up with Northwest Europe on fiscal revenues per capita. Um, that's the sort of the fiscal state side. Also, though, the constraints on the executive side, um, I think an ingenious paper by Van Zanden, Bering and Boska looked at a very crude measure this, um, parliamentary activity measured as the calendar years per century in which parliament met. 
uh, that is um, follows very different patterns in the North Sea area and in uh, the Mediterranean parts of Europe. So uh, the North Sea area you see very little parliamentary activity in the 12th and 13th century rising up to um, you know, parliament meeting every year by the 18th century. Uh, on the other hand in Spain and Portugal um, there's a peak. It starts off with high levels of parliamentary scrutiny of the executive and then uh, falling away from the 15th or 16th century. We should be a little cautious here. Um, a couple of papers recently say, well, that measure's too crude. You have to think about what the Parliament was actually doing. Um, it's a paper by Enriquez and Palmer, um, which is looking at how many laws were passed in a session, not just whether the session met. Um, and a great paper by um, Mikolaj Malinowski in the JH recently looking at the case of Poland-Lithuania, noting that, yes, the parliament continues to meet, but um, each member of parliament has a veto and it increasingly gets used and there's no effective constraint on the executive and um, the, uh, Poland re really kind of collapses. Um, well, we need to think about um, the role of the state in Asia as well. And again, I think you can see in the literature these two contrasting viewpoints. Early work writers like Jones and Landis, I think, tended to emphasize how um, or characterize Asian states as more centralized and autocratic than European states. There's the idea that the Europe, European states, there were lots of them, they were kind of competing um, uh, with each other, whereas in Asia you had large uh, central states. Um, but I think more recently we've seen um, people emphasizing the lack of fiscal capacity. Um, this is particularly a theme of Arthur Serrati's uh, book, um, he sees the uh, lack of state capacity in Asia as the key to the Great Divergence. And this is in some ways consistent with the fiscal revenue data I just showed you. In India, you have the implosion of the Mughal Empire in the 17th, 18th centuries. Um, in China, um, the definitely a downward trajectory of um, fiscal revenue per capita during the Qing Dynasty. And um, there's a paper by uh, Sung Moriguchi comparing Tokugawa Japan and Qing China, showing a uh, greater uh, per capita tax revenue in Japan and greater provision of local public goods. Um, the last part of my talk, I just want to um, devote to the role of geography. And here I think, um, it's not just first nature geography that's important, um, although that does feature uh, sometimes in um, explanations of the Great Divergence. So coal um, has clearly had an important role in explaining the location of modern industry in Europe. You can find that in the writings of Pollard and Wrigley. Uh, and it's also mentioned in the work on China by Pomerantz as you know, the, the absence of coal uh, in the right places. However, I think we can't stop at first nature geography because something like coal was always there under the ground. And the, the interesting issue is when is it utilized? And this brings us to second nature geography, um, where we have to think about man-made factors like access to markets, agglomeration economies. So this is very much drawing on the uh, new economic geography literature of people like Krugman and Venables. So in this framework, first nature geography advantages are amplified by the forces of economic integration. So if you're in a, a favorable location that has high productivity, 
you know, well endowed natural resources, nice climate and so on, then you will attract people, attract capital, um, and that then leads to further increases in productivity because you have agglomeration benefits. If you're stuck in an unfavorable location, everything's exactly the opposite way around. You've got low productivity, you attract fewer people, you may be in fact become a source of migrate out migration um, and lose capital until you fall further behind. Uh, an important um, factor here is changes in trade costs. So if you have um, a fall in transport costs, for example, um, this can have very um, different effects on different regions where um, industry becomes clustered in a few favorable locations rather than being evenly dispersed around the world. You have to think if, if transport costs are very high, you have to produce close to the market. If transport costs fall, then you can concentrate production efficiently in one place and distribute the goods uh, around the world. Um, and uh, there's a great paper by Crafts and Venables um, really explaining um, developments since 1750 uh, in these terms. Um, what I've done here in figure eight is to extend this back to 1300 with the new GDP per capita data that we have and the, you know, the population GDP data that underpin them. And um, you can see that India, uh, which is the green area, and China, the blue area here, clearly dominate world production uh, in 1300. Um, it, however, the, the, the reason for this is largely population. Um, uh, it, so uh, European GDP per capita is lower than it is in China, but higher than it is in Asia as a whole. Um, so it's really, this, the Asian dominance here is driven by population. Now, the other thing which is quite striking from this graph is that the, the changes in the share of world regions uh, becomes much more dramatic from about, the, uh, about 1700. It starts with an increase in the British share, that's this light blue region, then it treads to the rest of Europe and in North America chips in. Um, and uh, there's only really two other periods which look like a, a, a start of perhaps growing European dominance. Uh, one is um, between um, 1300 and 1400, but that's really just driven by population dynamics again. So. Uh, Yes, Europe's population is growing rapidly and then it collapses with the, um, the Black Death. Uh, and although GDP per capita is rising in Europe after the Black Death, um, you know, Europe's share of GDP falls because of the dramatic fall in population. The other one is um, between uh, 1600 and 1700 and that's driven by Chinese population dynamics. That's the um, change between the uh, Ming and Qing dynasties, which give you a large fall in population and then a sharp rise. Now, for industrial production, I haven't yet managed to produce these, um, the industrial production shares back to 1300. I think it's not really possible at this point, although I, I hope in future it may be. Um, but you can see from the previous graph that it, you know, the, the scale of changes is much greater after 1700 anyway. Uh, so this does capture quite a lot. You can see that, uh, yes, the rise of Britain, Europe, North America um, is, is there in the GDP data, but it's much more, um, it's a much bigger effect in the industrial production. And that, that validates this Crafts Venables point about the growing concentration of, of industrial production in um, 
in the favorable locations so that the goods can then be exported around the world because transport costs are much lower. Uh, I want to end really with just sort of running you through uh, a second nature geography interpretation of the in British Industrial Revolution, which you, I think you can do with Bob Allen's uh, book um, from 2009. Um, he doesn't put it in these terms, but I, I think it, this is a good way of, of thinking about it. Uh, so you have the growth of London um, stimulates the northern coal industry because um, you know the, the woods become depleted around London. Um, you can't rely on wood for fuel uh, and it's replaced by coal which is being shipped down from Newcastle in the northeast. Um, that then stimulates the coal industry raises productivity in the coal industry uh, and you have uh, coal being available for industrial production. So this gives you the first element of Britain's unique factor price combination of low coal prices and high wages. And notice it isn't just first nature geography because the coal was always there. It, wait, it de depends on the growth of London to stimulate the demand, which then has agglomeration effects. Um, the high wages come from agglomeration economies associated with the growth of London and also Britain's success in international trade following the shift of Europe's trading focus from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic after 1500. So Britain was a backwater before 1500 in European context. After 1500 it becomes a, a hub of this triangular trade between um, Europe, North America and Africa. So market access matters then. You have high wages, low coal prices, and that stimulates the labour saving and coal using technology of the Industrial Revolution. So uh, I think I've just come to the end of my hour. Um, so let me conclude by saying that I think historical national accounting has now made a substantial contribution to understanding the Great Divergence. But on the other hand, there's still so much more to be done. It's, it's opened up lots more possibilities. We clearly need historical national accounts for more countries. And importantly, reaching back further in time. We don't want to start in the 19th century. That's too late. Um, there are many important gaps. I think the whole of Eastern Europe pretty much. There's one study on Poland. We really need Russia. That's a large economy we know we don't have data for. Um, India before 1600, I know there are some data there. Um, Southeast Asia is pretty much a complete blank apart from Indonesia back to about 1800. Um, we certainly need more regional disaggregation um, for these large Asian economies. China and India in particular. Um, we need then much more comparative data on the explanatory variables. So much work in the last decade or so has been on historical national accounts, getting a GDP per capita. We now need a big effort on the explanatory variables. I think the whole, the whole range of the variables here, labor, human capital, physical capital, is needed for most economies in Europe and Asia. Um, and turning to the ultimate sources, geography and institutions, again, more quantitative work um, uh, on institu institutions going beyond dummy variables. And um, I also think second nature geography should be a bigger part of the story. So um, I'll leave it there and look forward to your questions. Okay, thank you, Professor Barbary. Uh, now we, uh, uh, I will uh, moderate the discussion part and the Q and A from the audience. So first of all, uh, let's invite uh, Professor Zhu Chen to give some uh, comments. Uh, 
Oh, okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Trisha. Um, they're being sorry. This is, uh, um, I think they we're going back to what was uh, previously uh, arranged in terms of the format. Uh, I, I, I was not aware of this. Um, yeah, so uh, Steve, thank you for the uh, great overview. And this is a great summary of uh, many uh, uh, scholars uh, work. I just have one uh, uh, curious question uh, that is, uh, you know, the uh, so-called California school on the great divergence. Um, they have their own camp, uh, sort of, uh, as I have been uh, writing something recently on this topic. Uh, I've been very much uh, struck or impressed by the big difference in the approach and methodology uh, between the California school and uh, what you have been doing and, uh, and I, you have also reviewed uh, because of my un, uh, way, a sort of simple way of summarizing how they do uh, research on ex to explain the great divergence uh, they basically pick and choose uh, anecdotal uh, evidence uh, or cases from China versus from uh, Europe. Uh, if they can identify some phenomena or some a special case in China that would match uh, many of the points you were making about um, the different European countries uh, in the late Middle Ages or the early modern period, uh, then they would say, aha, so that was done in China too, because this guy, that company, and was doing very similar things. How, how do you respond uh, or address this uh, difference in methodology? Uh, I, I'm pretty sure many of uh, our colleagues uh, in the audience uh, have been very much puzzled too by the two uh, approaches uh, that seem to be uh, speaking different languages and go their own ways. Um, how would you address this um, big? Yeah, I mean, I, I actually like to try to um, try to see um, some good in the California school. Um, and I, I must say, I, I entered the Great Divergence debate, I suppose, being very sceptical of the California school view, but I thought it was interesting and worth investigating. And um, I agree that sometimes they've been less systematic <coughs> than... Um, than, than, than I would want, want them to be. Um, but I think there's, um, I think they've been successful at least in making European economic historians uh, think about um, the size of the units being compared. Um, and that it was, all too easy for European economic historians to um, just assume that um, if you showed Italy was ahead of um, the whole of China, that, that that was sufficient. But in fact, because we were used to collecting data on Europe at the sort of national level, <laughs> and these are much smaller units, then um, you know, we have to be be a bit fairer, I think, and say, well, maybe the Yangtze Delta was um, just as rich as Italy or... Um, and, and, and I think we've, therefore, there's been some coming together here. I don't think the, the debate is quite as polarised as it once was. Um, and, um, you know, but, okay, there are differences of methodology as well, but I think we should recognise that things have come rather closer together. I mean, our... But if you just looked at the data for China as a whole and you compared it with 
Italy or the Netherlands, then you would conclude the Great Divergence had already occurred by 1300. Um, and I'm saying, well, no, but when you make an allowance for the Yangtze Delta, um, th that's not the case because still in around about 1700, they look like they're on about a par. Um, so that already shifts the dating of the Great Divergence by 400 years. Now it's not as far as Pomerantz originally claimed, but I think in fairness, I've, uh, um, Ken Pomerantz has in at least three places written that he no longer thinks uh, China was on a par with uh, the richest parts of Europe until 1800. He thinks it's maybe seven, between 1700 and 1750. That's getting quite close to the um, position that I'm taking. Um, so yeah. I think there's some movement on both sides. I mean, that's not going to be true of everyone <clears throat> in the California school, but it is true of Ken Pomerantz, I think. Yeah, I think you're moving um, the starting date back by uh, three centuries or four centuries would make uh, some of the scholars in the California school scramble more uh, uh, significantly because I've noticed some of the recent uh, efforts trying to use the work by Zelin and others uh, on uh, Chinese uh, companies uh, that were operating in the 19th century in order to claim that uh, Europe was, all, I mean, China was already no different from uh, Europe uh, uh, before the Industrial Revolution and so on. Um, so you're moving the great divergence timing uh, back by a few centuries would not make it easier for them to uh, be able to use later evidence to make the claim that China and uh, England were very similar. Uh, uh, anyway, so it kind of, uh, I, I know David, David was uh, smiling earlier. He, he has something to say on this. Huh? So. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Okay, thank you. Okay, Professor Debbie Ma, can you give us some comments? I actually forgot why I was smiling, but uh, <laughs> thanks for a great talk. I'll try to be brief. Um, it really, uh, hearing Steve again after so long because of the pandemic, uh, remind me of the good old times when we have these debates in, in person. So it still feels a little bit strange uh, um, talking to me. Maybe that's why one reason I was, I was smiling. Um, really, I want to keep my comments relatively brief because I do notice there are, there are at least seven questions now that, that hopefully Steve can get to them. One was a comment, the other was a very quick question. Um, the comment was, I was quite struck by these terminologies, uh, industrial revolution. As you know, in you can see similar patterns, not just for Japan and Europe, but also for China and India. And, but they, they, they were quite somewhat differently. There's a, there's a well-known term which is called involution. And there's also the term which is called labor-intensive industrialization. And I have a feeling when the countries were poor, instead of being called industrial revolution, they were called involution, which is you know, what Philip Huang was saying. And when a country was moving from a relatively poor country to a rich country, that is called labor-intensive industrialization. So, I mean, one of the features, I, I, I'm a little bit skeptical in the sense that one common feature of East Asian economies that they are really very, very hardworking. And you see that happening, not just for Japan, but also certainly for parts of the rice economies in East Asia. A uh, very quick question. I think other people probably ask you about that as well. I was very struck by the very large uh, drop in per capita income in the 18th century. And that was the high chain, and that was probably driven by the whatever the population explosion and all of that. Um, anyway, I, I, you don't have to answer that if you, if you don't want to spend time on that. But that, well, one thing I think you need to find other comparable evidence on prices, wages, uh, other things to really you know, collaborate that very large drop in per capita GDP. Okay, again, thanks for the great talk. That's all my world. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, yeah. Um, I think that's right about um, industrious revolution. Um, 
it's not it's certainly not unique to um, Europe <laughs> um, and you, you might I mean there's a case for saying involution in China um, I suppose it's why I lumped together the um, the labor issues together with human capital and um, you know if you don't have the movement to invest in uh, in human capital then it's it's got to run into diminishing returns because you can't go on working harder forever. Um, you're going to come up against the 24 hour constraint. Um, so you'll notice I, I did emphasize that on the labor issue in the long run, you can, um, you must have the uh, accumulation of human capital as well. Otherwise it's going to peter out. And that's perhaps what's happening in the Chinese involution. So without, and that required the demographic regime to be different. Um, and uh, prices and wages and other things, yes, I agree completely. Uh, we need more and more data. Um, I think one of the nice things though in the end um, is that you, to deal with the regional variation, you do need to have um, more than just, you know, wage data will come from typically one city or whatever. And what you want is a comparable size region to the regions <coughs> of Europe that we have, which are nation states. Um, and so I think we do in the end need to come up with something like GDP per capita um, so that we can make the comparison systematically over roughly equal sized regions. Okay, thank you, Professor Broberry. I have a question uh, about the comparison between China and Europe in terms of their uh, income level or GDP per capita in the long run. As shown in one of your figures, after basically 1700, the income level of China uh, had a big drop, is that right? Uh, yeah, so yeah. I want to know, uh, what's your view about the main reason behind this sharp drop of China's income level? I'm, uh, I'm just wondering whether this is related to China's the trade policy. For example, China uh, almost uh, closed the foreign trade uh, at some time uh, upon the trade ban of the Qianlong Emperor. Uh, leaving only Canton or Guangzhou as the only trading ports with the rest of the world. Meanwhile, uh, Europe, especially Western Europe, Britain and Fr uh, France, uh, actively engaged in the, in the uh, uh, expansion and foreign trade with the other countries. So whether or not this uh, divergence or different trade policy or openness played a very important role in driving the divergence after the 1700, based on your figure. What's your view on this? Yeah. Um, but I think there are sort of two answers I can give here. One, one is to say, um, in, a, in a kind of proximate way at least, the, the reason GDP per capita falls is because it's, GDP is dominated by agriculture. And you, what you have is a, fantastically high population growth. And although there is some expansion of the cultivated area, it's not sufficient to stop the land labor ratio declining quite a lot. So this is in some sense, coming back to Devin's idea about involution. It, the, um, the land labor ratio is declining sharply. And since agriculture is the dominant activity, um, you, I mean, there's also some small increase in um, in grain yields, but not sufficient to offset the declining land labour ratio. So that I think is is really what fundamentally drives this. It's it's a it's, it's a population explosion, and it 
it's a you know, kind of classic Malthusian um, outcome, I suppose. Um, but you're right that, of course, China's uh, turning inward and, um, and the European states are looking outward. Um, and turning inward um, probably affects everything um, and at least prevents the development of um, other sectors that, that would be um, a counterweight to the um, to the decline in output agricultural output per person. Um, yeah, that, that's I think the best I can do in a in a nutshell. Okay, thank you. A related question is that you know after basically seventeen hundred, uh, the Canton of Guangzhou was the only port of China. Uh, meanwhile, the British East India Company actually monopolized most of the trade between China and the West uh, uh, at some time. Uh, meanwhile, Canton in China actually had the very famous, the, the so-called 13 home or 13 factories, uh, a monopolized trade company. Uh, actually, it produced many uh, rich guys like uh, uh, Wu Bingjian and many others. So I'm just wondering whether can compare the income level or economic prosperity between uh, only the Canton province or the Pearl River Delta with, uh, with England, with the Netherlands, instead of comparing the entire China with, uh, with Europe. Is there any data on this, on, on, on Canton province? Well, actually, yes, so funny enough, I, I, there's a, a student at Cambridge He's Chinese, and he um, he's he submitted um, a PhD uh, application to look at the long run development of the Pearl Delta region, um, which I think is is a very promising project. And um, he had outlined the kind of sources and so on. He was quite hopeful of being able to do this. Um, I'm not sure uh, what's going to happen about that, but I think. It would be a very good idea. Um, as I said, my um, speculation really about the GDP per capita in the richest region of China is, is, is really based on um, the scale of the difference in the 1820s and saying, well, let's assume that that ratio holds through time. It's a fairly conservative um, difference, I think, 75% um, above the average. Uh, that's, that's, as I say, that's not out of line with other economies in the pre-industrial world. Um, but I think it's, it could be different regions at different points in time. I mean, certainly it changes a lot in Europe. I know, um, obviously, well, Philip Wang worked, I suppose, on the assumption that he looked at um, the Yangtze Delta and um, her bay, I guess. Um, so that's another up in the north. Um, it's another possible area to investigate. I really think we need more regional work on, on China, more regional quantitative work. And hopefully that is beginning now. Okay, thank you. We really look forward to, to seeing the new data on that. Well, in the remaining time, I will uh, select some questions from our audience for Professor Broberry's uh, reply. Uh, the first one, uh, I think this is a big question. Uh, to what extent do you think the Northwest European practices of colonialism and slavery were responsible for the Great Divergence? Yes, this is um, a very big topic. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, well, I think um, the, obviously these are um, these are um, obnoxious practices. Um, but if we ask, to what extent did they? create the wealth that 
um, allowed um, Northwest European development? I think the answer is it's, it's not that big a factor. Um, I think the way you want to, and the way you want to think about this, I mean, if you do the cost benefit analysis, you have to invest to colonialize. You have to have a big Navy like the British had. Um, so, and you ask what return do you get on that? Um, most um, studies that have tried to do this um, find relatively low rates of return. Indeed, um, probably it's fair to say it's about the risk-free rate of return. In other words, you would have done just as well to invest in a completely safe asset um, like government bonds, uh, and you'd have got the same return as from uh, most European powers got from their colonies. Now, the thing that's, um, that, that causes a puzzle of them, then why did they do it? And the answer here is that it's a difference between social returns and private returns. So the private returns were extremely high. Some people made fabulous fortunes from this. Um, but it wasn't very good for the country as a whole. Um, and the reason this was, was done was that the people who made the fast fortunes were very well represented in Parliament. And they uh, always voted for um, you know, the state support for these merchants. Um, and therefore, I, you know, I don't see it as, as a fundamentally um, crucial part of the uh, development process. Um, when, you, when you distinguish between the social returns and the private returns. So tremendous private returns, but not so great social returns. And um, I, I don't see that as the, the, the real fundamental driver of the development process. Okay. So here there's a question from uh, Professor G. V. Chen uh, at NUS. Uh, thanks for this very interesting presentation. Just a thought. I wonder whether the urbanization rate across regions in the world can be also explained by difference in the degree of fiscal centralization. In this case, uh, the agglomerate uh, effect could be also explained by the fiscal centralization. Is that right? Um. Okay, so the idea is that the um, urbanization is explained by fiscal centralization. Um, well, this is, I suppose, getting at the difference between ultimate and proximate sources. Um, so, um, the fiscal centralization is, is the fundamental um, driving force, and then it will affect some of the um, proximate sources that we looked at earlier. And that, that, so that, that seems to me to be, um, uh, yes, that's, that is a, uh, a reasonable presumption, I think, yeah. Okay, uh, maybe the last question we leave for our uh, PhD student. Uh, he's asking that, what's the relative importance between institutions, geography, and the endowments in explaining the divergent development between East and West? Again, I think this is a big question. What's your view? <laughs> yes, yes, this is a very big question. Um, so, um, I think um, what I would just trying to sketch out in the end with that little story of the Industrial Revolution was a sort of linkage. Um, <clears throat> I think, you know, economists for a long time would have kind of two kinds of fundamental sources. One was institutions and one was geography. 
and by geography they meant first nature geography you know the the endowments and so on and i and i think the, the problem with that is is that the resources are always there so you need to think about why are they utilized at one point in time rather than another and that brings us to the second nature geography and the second nature geography may well be related to institutional factors as well um, so that um, yeah in some ways there um, just focusing on institutions in my view is not quite satisfactory because because of these second nature geography effects because you can just happen to be as a country stuck in the wrong place i think you might we might reasonably say that's what's happening in italy i mean you either have to think well the italians you know had great institutions at the time of the roman empire and into the middle ages they they began the revival of the long distance trade with china and the east um, along the Silk Road. So do we think, well, that they had, they, they had good institutions then, there's no doubt about it. It, it, it worked well. And then we have to conclude they did badly after 1500, so they had bad institutions. Did it just happen that the institutions that were great suddenly became bad, or is it that actually there, was, there were these other forces that changed the whole geography of Europe? Um, and instead of the Mediterranean being the center of economic activity, it became a backwater. Um, and, and, and you know, there was nothing they could do, however good the institutions were, on its own it wasn't enough because they were, they were cut off from the right geography. Um, so I think geography and institutions, um, they, you know, they, they both matter. Um, and we can't just focus on one. And I think perhaps economic history for a long time has focused on institutions since the work of Douglas North. And it's great work and I, I really admire the people who do it. And I work with John Wallace, who's a great institutional <laughs> economic historian. Um, but I think it's incomplete without recognizing um, the second nature geography. Okay, many thanks, Professor Broberry. Uh, for time reason, uh, we have to skip the, the many other questions from our audience. Uh, sorry about that. But we will forward all of your questions uh, and the comments to Professor Broberry for her consideration later. Uh, so in the end, let's uh, uh, welcome Professor Chen to give a concluding remark. Oh, okay. Oh, I was just going to say, actually, uh, one of our colleagues at uh, Hong Kong U uh, Gosan Mosin uh, was asking uh, Steve to comment on the quality uh, on some of the uh, critiques on the use of uh, bad economic data uh, from China uh, and compare and use them to compare China with Europe. I assume he thinks uh, the European historical data are, are of much higher quality. So how would you say about um, the impact of uh, bad historical quality uh, data from China mm -hmm. versus good or better uh, quality data from Europe? Yeah. Well, um, I, I think obviously we have to make the best, we do the best we can with the data that we have. And, um, my own view is that people assumed for too long that the data was worse than it is, you know, or, or that there was less of it available. And I think it's good that we are now seeing an upsurge of uh, quantitative economic history from China. And we'll have to make up our minds some way down the line. Um, how much worse is it than European data? Um, but you know, bear in mind that there's an enormous range of quality of data within Europe. Um, Britain is very well endowed with, with data. Um, a lot of data has survived and it's, um, it seems to be pretty good quality, but um, 
there are other parts of Europe where I'm sure it's no better than in China. And indeed, um, you know, China had this fantastically developed bureaucracy by Western standards for much of the period. Um, I think we, we would be unwise to throw that away and not make the best of it that we can. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, partly because uh, I have some self-interest in this. You know, when we try to promote mm. quantitative methods uh, to do historical research, uh, you know, we have always been asked this question uh, and challenged that, uh, you know, how can you uh, use historical data when they're so bad, they're not so available. So, so this is something of a concern, I, I assume, uh, especially to many uh, uprising young scholars. So I, I put out a help, but I want to use this opportunity <laughs> to get your take. Uh, thank you very much for sharing uh, your research and uh, your thoughts uh, on a very, very uh, interesting uh, topic uh, that is the uh, great divergence. Of course, for, uh, for this literature, you know, you have done so much work and uh, have uh, made so much contribution. Uh, so thank you for uh, uh, presenting uh, your latest uh, work uh, on this occasion. I also want to uh, thank uh, Derbing for uh, doing such a wonderful job chairing today's uh, webinar for us, uh, even so remotely from London, okay? Uh, okay, so Thanks uh, to all of you um, for joining uh, this uh, very uh, great webinar. Uh, so coming up uh, next is uh, a week from today, we have uh, Ron Harris uh, from the University of uh, Tel Aviv in Israel. Uh, so he is going to talk about his uh, uh, recent book that just came out about three months ago, uh, Going the Distance, uh, Eurasian Trade and the rise of the business corporation uh, from uh, 1400 to uh, 1700. Uh, he's a legal historian and uh, he has written a lot on the history of business organizations uh, from a legal perspective. So uh, please uh, uh, join us uh, next week and uh, you will not uh, regret uh, uh, you know, if you do that. All right. Uh, thanks uh, again to everyone. Okay. And thank you for me. Bye, Steve. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Debbie. Mm. Bye. Uh,